wants to is with me and who is betraying me. This is Dutch Vanderland, a tyrannical king among men. Not only does this megalomaniac make for one of the most interesting video game characters of all time, but the way his personality plays off the protagonists of both Red Dead Redemption games cements Dutch as the perfect video game villain ever created. All your money. It weren't no match for a bunch of bumpkins. You are nothing. But before we get any further into this video, you should know that it includes major spoilers for both Red Dead Redemption games. Dutch Vanderlyn grew up in the throes of the American Civil War. Seeing his father fight and die for the Union's cause, Dutch's formative years were spent pining for freedom and independence, which he would pursue by any means necessary. He would go on to recruit a group of outlaws, including one Arthur Morgan and later a young John Marston. This group became the Vanderlyn Gang, and together they enjoyed decades of not so petty thievery and general lawlessness. But as time went on, the Wild West became less and less wild, leaving people like Dutch Vanderlyn lost, angry, and without a place in the world. Yes, much like the Vanderlyn gang itself, Dutch's character couldn't adapt to the changing times. That inability, or rather refusal to change, would ultimately lead to his downfall, which is as much a triumph as it is a tragedy. After all, his story is a sympathetic one. But he is in fact a villain in not just one, but two Red Dead games. While the character in game is a mess of complex contradictions, there's nothing contradictory about his effect on the larger Red Dead Redemption series. He is the perfect villain. His presence helped to make the games, and especially Red Dead Redemption 2, as perfect as it is. So fittingly, let's start by examining his role in RDR 2. Because of the way Red Dead Redemption 2's stellar story stands on its own, it can be easy to forget that it's actually a prequel to the first Red Dead Redemption game. This means that we get to see Dutch Vanderlyn in the prime of his lawless life. And it shows. He is an immediately charming character that's incredibly easy to warm up to, especially when playing as Arthur Morgan, one of his most loyal gang members. We've made a case for Arthur being the perfect anti-hero before, and he definitely is. But his entire arc is built off the back of Dutch Vanderlyn. I just want to see you meet your match when it comes to a, an aging predator with a big mouth, Dutch. Arthur spent most of his life committed to the Vanderlyn gang. He saw Dutch as a surrogate father, and rightfully so. While he wasn't exactly your traditional Western movie dad, Dutch taught Arthur how to read and write, and would later do the same with John Marston. The whole point of America is freedom. Freedom of thought, freedom of deed, freedom of action. He saw the members of his gang as a sort of family, and took Arthur out on his first big robbery. We don't want to kill any of you. But trust me, we will. Wake him up a little! They spent the night doling out money to poor people in town Robin Hood style. He wasn't just a teacher. He was a caretaker and a man with a strong sense of what was right and wrong. Dutch's early position as a mostly kind-hearted man who operated outside the law was something Arthur would also strive to emulate. That struggle between moral integrity and the call of criminal activity would eventually become the principal problem in Arthur's life, and his unfailing loyalty to the gang would cost him dearly. Dutch Vanderlyn was there for every step of Arthur's journey, from those early days when he regarded Arthur as a son to the final day when he stood over Arthur as he lay dying on the mountain. While Micah may have been the one to kill Arthur depending on how you play RDR2, Dutch Vanderlyn and the gang can still be blamed for his death. So how can a character go from a well-meaning, freedom-loving outlaw to an ego-driven, vengeful monster who is willing to let his family die and even kill them himself if it means he achieves his goals? And more importantly, how does a game developer execute such a severe heel turn without it seeming forced and poorly planned? The answer is a combination of experienced devs, a perfectly cast voice and mocap actor, and incredible writing. In a move that undoubtedly shaped the success of RDR2, the core creative team behind 2010's Red Dead Redemption returned for the prequel. That included not only the rock star writing staff, but the unceasingly talented Benjamin Byron Davis, who reprised his role as Dutch. Davis most certainly deserves a huge share of the credit that comes from this creation of Dutch as a character and also his believability as both a leader worth following and a monster worth hunting. The subtleties in his mannerisms and his speech patterns are in turn charming and terrifying, 
And that's all Davis. In RDR2, Rockstar displays such a solid understanding of the nuance that comes from featuring an outlaw gang in the American West. Sure, they take heavy inspiration from Western and samurai films, but inspiration only gets you so far. We noted earlier that Dutch wasn't a traditional Western movie dad, but he definitely was inspired by them. Fathers, symbolic or otherwise, in Western films were often portrayed as good law-abiding men looking out for their families in order to juxtapose the outlaw lifestyle our main characters often found themselves in. It could be argued that Dutch was good. Obviously, he wasn't law-abiding, but he certainly looked after his family of gang members. So Dutch fills that father role really well. But then, Rockstar twists it, perverts it. Rockstar has always been great with adding these extra levels to their characters, which is fortunate for them because they had to create a living world of characters with full, complicated lives essentially from scratch. Arthur Morgan is one such character, but Dutch Vanderland is arguably an even better example of just how rich and textured the lives and personalities of Red Dead characters truly are. His innate confidence and boldness helped him forge a path out of his turbulent upbringing and into a life as a successful outlaw. But as his empire grew, so did the towns and businesses that he was profiting off of. Self-assurance and an inflated ego blinded him to the coming changes, rules, and regulations until they were practically on top of him. Suddenly, Dutch is staring down the loss of his livelihood, his way of life, and possibly his actual life. What was once a man content to bask in the glow of admiration from the lawless people of the West is now a wanted criminal the scum of proper society. Of course, he resents that, and he resents the symbolic figureheads who he sees as responsible for this change in attitude. And those changes, along with the constant pressure to conform to them, hardens Dutch against society. From his prideful perspective, society should change around him, not the other way around. But of course, no one can stop progress, not even Dutch Vanderlyn, as much as he may try. So when members of his own gang start to lean toward conformity, Dutch has nothing left but rage and an appetite for revenge. When you look at it that way, his actions are almost understandable. If Arthur Morgan represents the struggle between doing good in the new world or remaining loyal to a dying way of life, Dutch Vanderland is the dying way of life. He is the living embodiment of the obstacle that's keeping Arthur from fully committing to a more peaceful existence. As such, there's no better villain to Arthur's story than Dutch Vanderland. And his slow build into that villainous role carries over beautifully into the events of the first Red Dead Redemption. Even in 2010, before we saw the more charming and human version of Dutch Vanderland, he was a great character. He punctuated every scene he was in with a reminder to John Marston and the audience that from where he's standing, he's not the bad guy. Instead, Dutch saw himself as a victim of circumstance, fighting for his right to exist in a rapidly changing new frontier. But with the additions to his character made in RDR2 in mind, the final showdown between John and Dutch in the first game takes on a whole new meaning. When I'm gone, they'll just find another monster. They have to. Not only is this the final conversation between what essentially amounts to a father and son, but it's also the last breath of a dying movement. We're seeing the culmination of decades of hardship, prosperity, and pride give way to exhaustion and resentment towards a system that has left people like Arthur, John, and Dutch out in the cold with their backs against the wall, or in this case, against a cliff face. John chose to change. He chose redemption for the sake of his family. Dutch chose to stagnate. He chose to stick to his guns even in the face of dying alone and friendless. But both of them ended up dead in the end. Dutch went out on his own terms, while John was subject to a firing squad, and that might be the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, of Dutch's villain arc. Like he told John, when I'm gone, they'll just find another monster. They have to. And for all the showmanship and overconfidence, he was right. When it comes down to it, Dutch isn't a criminal mastermind. He isn't an impossibly strong supervillain. He isn't really a traditional villain at all. He's a friend a father figure and a deeply flawed human being that chose revenge over redemption. And that's what makes him the perfect villain. Thanks so much for watching this video all the way to the end. While you're here, make sure to like the video, subscribe to Nerdstalgic Gaming, and let us know in the comments. Do you think Dutch Vanderlyn is the perfect villain? If not, who is? I'll see you next time.